Well, you know, I've talked to several historical groups, and I have the same complaint here that I do had with all the others, and that is, as I look around, I see an awful lot of gray hair. <laughs> and I wish that you would figure out a way to get some young people involved in this, some high school students, to get people interested. Uh, it shouldn't be something for people my age and your age. It should be for everybody. And I think we need to do this. And I don't know how you do it. I don't have any suggestions. But it's just something to think about. The, uh, I brought notes along. The reason I do that is so that if I have brain freeze, I'll be able to know where I am. Uh, that's probably the... Uh, the worst thing that can happen to any speaker is to forget suddenly where you are. A stranger uh, coming into Port Clinton from the east on Route 163 suddenly finds himself on Perry Street. And uh, it's perfectly appropriate because uh, Oliver Hazard Perry is certainly the biggest hero of this county. They, we named the street after him. We named the Masonic Lodge after him named the credit union after him. There's a ship in the United States Navy named after him. And there are various monuments and the like. They even named a cave after him. Uh, so he is a hero of the county. And after you, uh, you proceed down Perry a little bit, you come to this, the streets named after trees. There's Buckeye and then Maple and all the way to Elm. And then you start naming them after presidents and you got Hayes who's not my favorite president, but it's the street where I live, so I hear the name a lot, and Lincoln, and Fulton. Wait a minute. There was no President Fulton. Why on earth did we suddenly have a street in the middle of the presidents named after the uh, inventor of the steamboat? Well, that's uh, one of the mysteries, I think. Uh, most people that come through are driving along and they don't notice a little monument that's uh, north side of Perry Street, right at the end of Fulton. There's no place to park, even if they did see it, and, and the only way that you could get to it would be to park on one of the side streets and duck through the traffic on Perry's to get over there to find it. So people just never quite see it. And yet, on an early fall day in the year 1813, one of the great, most dramatic events in American history took place there. Um, Perry's fleet was anchored just offshore. He had eight of his ships, or rather, uh, yes, eight of his ships, and six of the British ships were anchored there. And they were a pretty battered bunch of ships. They had just come off a of battle. Uh, on uh, September 10th, and uh, there was a long boat, there were a series of long boats that had bought, brought the crews ashore, and they were all milling around there. It must have been a very dramatic sight. They were a motley crew. Uh, many of them had bandages, because many of them had been wounded in the battle, and about a third of them, and this is something you may not know, about a third of them were African Americans, United States Navy. Um, Jerry Altoff, who used to be the historian over at the Perry Monument, did a great deal of research on those black men. And Perry, when he had received them as crew that were sent to him, complained that you sent me all these black men. And the answer that was given was that I count them among my very best men. And that was what the title of Jerry Altoff's book is. If you get a chance to read it, it's really interesting. He did great research on it. Many of them, as I said, were in bandage, injured in battle. Now, it had been a very severe battle. Lawrence, the Lawrence on which Perry had sailed was severely damaged and sunk. As a matter of fact, every person, every sailor that was on that ship was injured or killed, except for one, Oliver Hazard Perry. And he was in the middle of the battle at all times. 
So he wasn't wounded that day. And he had sent after that battle one of the most remarkable messages, I think, that I have ever read. Uh, I've always been interested in English and in language, and this is why it impresses me. He said, we have met the enemy, and they are ours. He didn't say, we have met the enemy and we've defeated them, because that would imply that maybe he had just driven them off. But when he said, they are ours, it was the only time in the history of the world that an entire British fleet had been captured before or since. That is a remarkable thing in itself. Oliver Hazard Perry was 28 years old from Rhode Island. 28 years old. I complained that you didn't have any young people, very many young people here. 28 years old to me in charge of one of the most important naval battles in American history. Isn't that remarkable to you? What is remarkable was that he, he was sent to Lake Erie and no one thought that it mattered very much because that's, this isn't where the battle was going to be. He came here with part of the crew and had to build his own ships, had to build his own fleet before he could do anything. Now, many of the guys that he had in his crew were Kentuckians and they weren't sailors at all. And they immediately got seasick. So it could not have been a lot of fun to have been the uh, head of that fleet. And still, despite all of those problems, he prevailed and defeated the British and sent that remarkable message, we have met the enemy and they are ours. And now on this September day, his ships are anchored at the end of the Portage Trail where General Harrison awaits him with an army of 2,500. It's another motley crew. They're in buckskin and butternuts and homespuns. They're frontiersmen. They're men who fought Indians. They weren't trained in any kind of military uh, operations. They were militia. They had to supply their own weapons, their own ammunition, their own food. And they had come across the Sandusky Bay and up the ancient trail that is today um, Fulton Street to meet Oliver Hazard Perry. The reason that they came this way rather than marching up to Detroit, which was their object, was the Great Black Swamp. You couldn't, get, you couldn't march through it. Now, some of the cavalrymen had gone that way and the horses could make it through, but you couldn't march men through. It was a barrier. So they're milling there at the end of what is today Fulton Street, 2,500 of Harrison's men and the crews from Perry's fleet. They boarded the ships. They sailed north. They took Fort Detroit, and they marched east to what is today Chatham, Ontario, and there they defeated the British and killed the Indian chief Tecumseh at the Battle of the Thames. And that ended the War of 1812 in the Northwest Territory. Perry died five years later of yellow fever in Venezuela. His body was taken back to Rhode Island for burial. Harrison's military career had virtually ended there, too. He was a man who was in many quarrels with his superiors. He became a governor, a senator, a farmer, and he was elected president in 1840. The slogan that year was Tippecanoe and Tyler II. No mention of the Battle of the Thames, only mention of the Battle of Tippecanoe, which is in Indiana. Um, he has several firsts. He was the, or, or lasts, he was the last president born before the Constitution went into effect. He was the president who served the shortest term. He was a rather long-winded fellow. And on March 4th, 1861, when he gave his inaugural address in the rain and the cold, he spoke longer than anybody else had ever done before or since, caught pneumonia, and died 32 days later. Uh, 
a curse supposedly was put on him by the Tecumseh's brother, the prophet. And that was that every president born in the year that ended with, the, with zero would die in office. And it was true. Harrison died in office, and then Lincoln, and then Garfield, and then McKinley, and then Harding, and then Roosevelt, and then Kennedy. And they were the only presidents that died in office. Only in years that ended with a zero, when they were elected in a year that ended with zero. Uh, I don't believe in curses, but it is uh, one of those remarkable things. Uh, Reagan was the first president to be elected in a year ending in zero and survive. Well, Harrison's meeting with Perry here is almost forgotten, except for that little monument down there that nobody much sees. Sometimes I can almost see that panorama. The ships, the sailors, the frontiersmen, the young commodore, the lanky general, uh, who was older, more experienced. I guess it's a benefit of being a historian, I suppose, I don't know. I can't. I know I can't drive down Fulton Street without seeing Harrison's weary men trudging along that dusty trail coming north to save a nation. But they weren't the first to use that trick. Not by any means. The, the Indians had used that path for centuries. It was a well-worn path. The Indians were a migratory group, and they go all the way from Hudson Bay all the way down into Kentucky. And one of the reasons we know is because of geologists. Geologists find the spear uh, flints all the way to Hudson Bay and all the way to Kentucky, and they match them with the flints found at Flint Ridge in Licking County, Ohio. If you've ever been to Flint Ridge, it's a remarkable kind of place <laughs> with this outcroppings of flint, and the Indians came from all over there. Um, Present-day Fulton Street was a major artery along that way that the Indians used. It was a portage. The Indians carried their boats. And they followed the waterways all the way. Thus it uh, was natural that when the French controlled this area, that they would build their trading posts there, their forts, their missions, along that portage trail. There, was at, there were at least three forts and duskies. Uh, one is uh, over in Sandusky, one is south of the Sandusky Bay, and one of them is at the other end of the Portage Trail on the bay. Um, this was about 1750 that this was built, about 60 years before Perry and Harrison. At this point, much of most of Canada, all of Ohio, we still have traces of the French here with names. Uh, the Tucson River, which we mispronounce, but, uh, and other things. They control all this, all of Ohio, and all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And England had designs on it because it was a, a rich territory with particularly furs. Uh, so they had, they had designs on it. And it would result in the French and Indian War of the mid-1700s. Uh, and it would result in France losing all of that territory. And the flight of the, the Acadians to Louisiana, which took place in 1755. If you've ever read um, Evangeline of uh, Al uh, Longfellows, that's about that. Uh, the people that are, are in um, Louisiana today are called Cajuns, which is a bastardization of the term Acadians. Um, but I digress. Uh, this, you still need this as background for what comes next. In 1754, a French soldier named Deliri, and I'll, I'll pronounce his first names as best I can, Gaspard Joseph Chassegros Deliri had very fancy names then. Um, 
He was uh, sent out in exploration and mission from uh, Presque Isle, which is today in um, Erie, Pennsylvania. And he was to go along the southern shore of Lake Erie all the way and end up um, with his soldiers fortifying, helping to fortify Fort Detroit. He was a remarkable man to Leary. He was born in, in Quebec in 1721, which means that he was 30-some years old at this point. He was an engineer. He had expertise in building forts. That was his main thing. He was also a soldier, and he had a distinguished and honored career. He set out on July 30th, 18, in 1754, with 285 soldiers and 27 boats. Now, I'm not much of a mathematician, but that comes to, what, 12 men a boat. So these weren't little, little canoes. These were pretty good-sized boats. Um, the accounts differ a little bit on exactly how many, but we have to depend upon Deleary's own journal from that period, which still exists in Canada. Uh, they rowed west in these boats along the shore, and he mapped where the rivers came in. And that must have been difficult because you're at the level of the water and it all looks flat. It would have been difficult. He entered Sandusky Bay on August 4th, 1754, in a big storm. Uh, they weren't sure they were going to make it. They were uh, trying to keep from being capsized. And when they came across the bar, the sandbar, into Sandusky Bay, they landed, he said, on a small island just inside the bay. And there they dumped the water out of their boats. And that's the first mention, to my knowledge, of, of any European mention of, of what is today Johnson's Island. Um, they rested a while, and then they rowed on up the bay to Fort Sandusky, which is at the end of the portage. They found it burned. They found it completely gone. No sign of anyone. They saw dimly across Sandusky Bay some figures, some men. They fired their rifles thinking that that might be Frenchmen. And they weren't answered and the men disappeared down there. And Deleary didn't know what else to do. So they set out up the trail. They started north on that portage. The word portage comes to us from the French, portage, and that comes from the Latin, which simply means to carry, because you had to carry your boat. They carried the boats from one waterway to another, from Sandusky Bay to Lake Erie in this case. Now, Deleary reckoned the distance at 57 arpents, A-R-P-E-N-T-S, I wasn't familiar with that word. Um, I assume that he counted the paces, the arpents. An arpents was 180 feet Canadian. If you're in France, it's 200 feet. <laughs> this makes it all very confusing, doesn't it? Uh, I'm assuming he's using the Canadian version of it, um, which would mean that it was about 10,260 feet from the bay. Does that sound about right to you? A little less than two miles um, that they had to carry. He noted on the way that they crossed two prairies. He didn't say anything about the hospital or <laughs> any of the, the bar there or, or my barber shop or any of that. Um, at the end of the trail, when they got to the lake, they reboarded their boats, and they went on to Detroit, and they arrived on August 6th. And I think that's remarkable. They started out on July 30th, and they rode all that distance and arrived on August 6th. I wonder how many men could do that today. That sounds rather difficult in that short time, doesn't it? Uh, well, anyway, Deleary would fight for the French, in the war against the English, in the French and Indian War. And when his side lost, he became a loyal to England. 
Uh, he didn't flee to Louisiana. He was wounded at the Battle of the Plains of Abraham when uh, Wolfe defeated Montcalm. He went back to France, and he found that he wasn't welcome there because he had kind of pledged allegiance to the English. So he went to London, and there he was welcomed by the King of England, who was uh, much taken by Deliri's wife. She was described as quite beautiful. And uh, uh, Deliri was uh, a little uh, put back by all of this uh, attention that the king had given. Uh, in Canada today, there's a statue to him. There's a street named after him in Montreal. There is a government building named after him. And the only monument we have is that little stone thing down here. <laughs> There's uh, no real moral to this. <laughs> and there's no great lesson. Uh, you know, um, George Santayana said those who are don't pay attention to history are condemned to repeat it. Well, human beings don't pay attention to history and they keep repeating the same. You know, uh, insanity is defined as... Uh, the, the belief that if you repeat a an action that has always failed, that this time it will have different results, uh, and that's and that's what humans do. All this happened just a long time ago in our town. They were exciting days, I think, to consider uh, days without which we'd be. I won't say not here, but we'd at least be slightly different. And sometimes I almost imagine that I still see them all. Harrison and Perry and that milling army and the fleet and those weary French soldiers trudging along a dusty portage with their boats in the heat of August. Now I hope maybe you'll see them too. Thank you.